Yeah, so a little bit about myself. So I'm a psychology lecturer and researcher by day. I work at the University of Greenwich and I research uh, adult development, so how we continue to grow and transform and change through adulthood. And I apply the methods of science that psychology has developed to do that research and to inform my teaching. Uh, So that's me uh, in my, uh, for what I'm known for in in terms of my working life. When, When I'm not at work, as well as being a parent, I would describe myself as a committed spiritual explorer. So, uh, and for me, meditation, prayer, um, uh, spiritual dance, including ecstatic dance, just five rhythms, biodanza, what I would call deep listening in terms of contemplation using music, and uh, for me also sacred medicines, particularly ayahuasca, have all, all been part of my spiritual path. And for me, have been integral in developing the side of myself that is somewhat neglected when I'm doing my intellectual work at university. And so in a sense, the book that I wrote about balancing science and spirituality was a kind of a personal odyssey, even though it's not about me, the book. It's, about, it's kind of a map for understanding how they relate. But it relates to my own personal journey and how I've tried to balance my own head and my heart and sometimes failed and sometimes done better and sometimes found a working balance. So I'm going to start off by telling two versions of a story, and the story is simply the story of what we now refer to as the modern era or modernity, um, the culmination of which we we are living in now, and the the values of which still permeate our existence. And you'll see why I'm going to pitch you this historical uh, uh, conception before I then describe the scheme of my book, which is how I also lay out the book. The, 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 The first substantive chapter is a little bit of history. So the conventional story of modernity, as told through many books and in many scholarly journal articles that have analysed it, goes something like this. Tracing it back to around about the 1680s, <clears throat> some very important things happened in the 1680s, one of which was that Newton published his Principia, and that really meant that mechanistic science, mathematical science, was, was, was on a, a more sound footing than ever before. The Royal Society was... Uh, founded uh, and that made science that gave science a stronger professional identity than it had ever had before in that same decade a guy called Robert Hooke uh, published a book called Micrographia which was the first ever book of images that had been seen through a microscope which is very important because it was, uh, it was a, a publication that a lot of the general public read and for the first time ever they saw this, the, the tiny world as conveyed uh, through a microscope, and it was an, in, it, it provided a huge amount of credibility and indeed funds for the Royal Society, uh, and it provided an insight. It was like a revelation for the scientific age about what you could do if you really observed the world carefully. Um, it was uh, it so happens that the Academy de Sciences in France was founded in the same decade as well. There was a real energy going around then in terms of the arrival of science. Um, Galileo who was a famous figure in the, in, in the development of science, was a little bit earlier, that he's an important figure because the conventional view of Galileo is of a kind of freedom fighter for science against the dogma of religion. This, you may know this version of the story where Galileo uh, was um, told, well, he found out through his, through, his, through his telescope that he found data that suggested that the Earth went round the sun and not vice versa. He then propounded this heliocentric model and the Catholic Church essentially denied... Uh, or, or, or refused the, 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 this possibility. They, uh, uh, they ostracized him, they put him under house arrest even for a while, and, uh, and they prevented the, anyone propounding the heliocentric model, the idea of the Earth going around the sun, for some time afterwards. And this was really suggested to be that Galileo was following the light of reason, the light of science, and that religion was holding him back. And broadly, the story that was emerging and, and that emerged during the scientific revolution was a that the, the religion was a childish superstition that we had to let go in order to emerge into this higher level of human maturity which science was auguring in. And Galileo was an example of that. He, he was letting go of dogma, following his eyes and, uh, and seeing what he could find out if he allowed his reason and evidence to, to lead him. Uh, I, I'll, I'm going to retell you that story later on because that's an oversimplistic conception of it. Uh, following the scientific revolution came the philosophical enlightenment, which broadly said, let's apply reason to everything, 
not just simply to philosophical issues, but we should apply it to morality and our day-to-day -day issues everywhere. And, and crucially, that everyone should, not just philosophers. It was, we were, it was beholden to all of us to use our reason, our understanding as best we could. Immanuel Kant uh, wrote a, 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 a brief article called What is the Enlightenment? And he said the Enlightenment is, uh, our, is man's emergence from his self-imposed immaturity. He said it's, it, this was, it was almost as though we were collectively becoming adults out of being children. And he said uh, the motto of the Enlightenment is have, have the courage to use your own understanding. In other words, follow reason and you'll be fine. This is what's going to illuminate the world. This is what's going to push us into the next level of human civilization. And following Enlightenment, and as, the, as science picked up steam and actually became something which we call science, because initially it was called natural philosophy when the Royal Society was founded, the word scientist wasn't actually coined until the 19th century. But as it gradually moved, uh, moved out in, in, in scope, it moved into things like paleontology, where we were studying fossils and archaeology and all sorts of ologies, and uh, crucially psychology in the end as well, which I'll come back to because it's an interesting place, psychology. It sort of it sits between science and spirituality. But at the, at the end of the 19th century, just as the theory of evolution was really picking up steam and the idea that life might, might be just molecules in motion, uh, some scientists decided to try and study psychology or the mind and using scientific principles as well. Um, and uh, Charles Darwin was actually one of the first to try. He wrote a book on uh, the study of emotion through facial expressions. So after he, he, he was done with the theory of evolution, he basically became a kind of an emotionless psychologist. Uh, now the picture is broadly the, uh, over this period that organised religion and religious uh, people who, who affiliated as religious gradually decreased in number, almost as though the, 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 there was this idea that as science picked up steam and as philosophy picked up steam, people gradually did, as some people have predicted, simply let go of religion as a childish superstition. For those of you who've, who've read any Freud, you'll know that that's exactly what he thought would happen. He thought that religion was a childish anachronism and that as we all grew up, we let it go. He thought it was essentially a kind of a father complex, which is why priests are called fathers, and certainly Christianity, and God's called a father, and Pope means papas in Italian, which is father. He basically thought it was submitting to paternal authority and not actually allowing yourself to be a grown-up. So there were evidence was, was, was bearing that out to a degree, because organized religion, the number of people that were going to church was in terminal decline and has been for some time now. Now, I should say that's specifically in Christianity, the picture complexifies a lot when you bring in all the other religions that have come to the UK. And this story, by the way, is a bit UK-centric, I, 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 I admit that. It's the picture that it paints uh, is still being painted with loads of, uh, of, of publications broadly in the, in the new atheist genre of a world that's gradually becoming more secular, finally letting all things spiritual and religious go so that we can, uh, as Kant had wanted or, or hoped many hundreds of years ago, all emerge into the light of reason and use our own understanding. Some recent headlines have been that, for the first time ever, those who identify as not religious has just increased in, in terms of prevalence over those who, who identify as religious, particularly amongst young adults. But this, again, is kind of fitting with that story. The story being the demise of the religious and the spiritual in the face of the rational and the empirical. It's a compelling story. As I say, it's been told many times. It's got a fancy name. It's called the secularization hypothesis in sociology and elsewhere. Uh, but it's wrong. It's not wrong in the sense that there are, it's, it's, it's propounding untruths, but it's, 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 a, it's so partial, it, it's half the story at best. So claiming to be the whole story is distorting. So it's a, it's a, it's a lie in the sense that it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a partial truth claiming to be the whole truth. So if we go back to the 1680s when science was kicking off, there were other things kicking off too. The, this rebellious spirit had infected the whole of society, not just science and not just philosophy, and religion too. And religion was going incred through incredible upheavals at the time. And religious societies were fragmenting off the Church of England and other religious groups to become these kind of quasi-religious, semi-mystical groups that were pursuing spirituality in new ways and letting religion go to a degree, or at least radically experimenting with doing it in new ways. So the, um, the motto of the Royal Society was nullius in verba, which means take nobody's word for it. And the, the, exactly the same... Uh, 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 adage was being propounded through these new non-conformist sects like the Quakers, the Seekers, the Ranters, the Muggletonians and all kinds of interesting mystical groups like the Rosicrucians and 
uh, and the Burmists, many more at the time. It was a time of incredible spiritual ferment, and a lot of the art at the time was very mystical and spiritual. So while the spiritual revolution was going on, there was a, excuse me, the scientific revolution was going on, there was a parallel, profound spiritual revolution as religion was being shaken up and being turned into new things. And actually many of the people involved in the scientific revolution were involved in that spiritual revolution too. Um, I mean, Newton would be one. Uh, he wrote more on spiritual matter than he did on scientific matters. And indeed, if people, uh, he would be considered to be extremely unconventional in his religious views now. Uh, you know, he, was, he, was, he was not interested in, in dogma or kind of uh, simple scripture, scriptural interpretation at all. He was, he was pretty out there. So it, as, as modernity passed on and we moved to the Enlightenment and, uh, and various other scientific revolutions, there, was, there continued to be this incredible ferment of spiritual innovation. Uh, probably most profoundly in Romanticism, which was a motley assembly of philosophies, art, artistic movements, and musical movements, all of which were inspired by this idea that the sacred and the spiritual was something that was in you, in your feeling, in your imagination, in your consciousness. And if you could express it in a way that was honest and authentic, then uh, that would be a, a spiritual act, irrespective of whether it had any relationship to religion at all. And in fact, most religious compositions, artworks, had no religious motifs at all. They were typically natural motifs of, uh, of, of, of landscape or about feeling um, or emotion. So a lot of uh, uh, romantic songs had names like tristesse, sadness, or you know, romantic artwork was almost always a kind of sublime, beautiful nature. And a lot of the people who were involved in that at the time were absolutely explicit that they were, they were releasing the spiritual impulse into something new, out of theology and scripture, into art, into beautiful music, uh, and, into, uh, and, and really giving people ownership of spirituality in the sense that it was something that everybody possessed. And this, I, I really can't overemphasize the importance and power of Romanticism over the modern mind. There is no way that you could say that it was less influential than science. If you consider who's more influential, Einstein or Beethoven, you know, Beethoven was romantic, it's a non-question. They're, they're two people who straddle modernity. They, they shape our world. Uh, and and, the, and the, the, artwork, the artwork and the music of the romantics, and all the way through into the neo-romantics like Vaughan Williams and loads and loads of 20th century uh, mu musicians and artists, all of whom were explicit that they were doing spiritual work, and that includes some of the, some of the key abstract art pioneers like um, Kandinsky, uh, Mondrian, who they absolutely said, listen, we're, what we're doing here is, 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 re, is, is giving you a vision of the sacred through art here. Um, all of them. I mean, the more I looked into it, the more I was blown away that what was actually going on through modern art and music was this kind of extraordinary spiritual um, uh, adventure. And Vaughan Williams, whose work, again, is like background music to our lives. It's everywhere. It's... Uh, it's uh, I think it's, it's probably some of the most played tunes ever on Desert Island Discs, <laughs> amongst other things. And Vaughan Williams described himself as a spiritual vagabond. He said, I am trying to reach out to ultimate realities through the means of ordered sound. <laughs> you know, he was not an easy listening guy. He was, he was trying to do spiritual work. Um, so, so the picture that I'm, that I'm trying to paint to you, and, this, and as I say, this is something that goes through lots and lots of, of different uh, you know, movements, people, ideas over several hundred years, is that the modern era has been both a, an incredible crucible for the development of science and philosophy, but equally has been an incredibly spiritual time. But, it is, but, but spirituality has twisted and turned into new things. So if you, if you only look at religious affiliation and religious attendance at churches, etc., you won't see how spirituality has reformed itself. But let's take, let's take some statistics. Um, currently in the UK, belief in the afterlife is around 55%, and it's remained thus for about 100 years. No decline at all. Belief in God or a higher spiritual power is currently around 68 to 70%. Less than America, but still pretty healthy. Uh, belief in angels amongst women is around 50%, amongst men is a bit less. It's actually going up. Some of the top-selling books, non-fiction books, uh, for the past two centuries have been non-religious spiritual books. One of the top-selling books of the 19th century was a book called In Tune with the Infinite by Ralph Waldo Treen. Sold millions of copies. Google it, you can get the PDF. Uh, one of the top-selling books of the latter half of the 20th century was Raymond Moody's Life After Life. Sold 15 million copies. Mind-boggling. 
So these books have, uh, have, have been, again, have been somehow tapping into something that's zeitgeisty, that really is about who we are and not some fringe thing. You know, Watkins is not fringe. <laughs> Uh, what, what you see in this bookshop is very much about the culture that we are and that we're becoming more and more and more. Obviously, things like meditation and spiritual practices are going up and up. The number of spiritual experiences that people report is going up and up and up. So if you graph it, it's just upwards. So we are not, folks, living in a disenchanted cosmos that has been devoid of meaning through materialism and consumerism. That is a, that is a, that is a simplistic story that is told for a reason, but it does not reflect reality. Sometimes I hear that story told by people who want to kind of say, we need rescuing, you know, we're a mess, something's up, you know, what do we need? We need, you know, we need to awaken now, we need a revolution now, but the fact is the revolution's been happening, we're part of it, uh, and that's exciting. And crucially, because, you know, I'm an adult development psychologist, and I'm interested in what it means to be a mature adult, Depending on which of those stories you buy changes what you consider to be a mature and optimal, optimally functioning person. If, uh, if it's the first story, the secularism story, then the, then the ideal adult is the, is the adult who has conquered his or her tendency towards superstition, supernaturalism, uh, uh, gullible, flaky thinking, and has emerged into reason. I mean, this was very much Freud's vision of the ideal human. Is to, is to allow the light of reason to leave the rest behind and that that will, lead, will, 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 will guide the way and be, and be the, the model of modern health. As it transpires, actually, that's actually a recipe for ill health. I'll come back to that later on. Uh, if you buy the other version, which says that you've got these scientific and spiritual strands that define our society and ourselves, then uh, an optimally functioning adult is one that manages to combine both in some kind of healthy tension. So that you have reason, you have evidence, you have your, your intellect intact, but you also give as much time as you do to that side of life to exploring all of the opposites, which you see in the diagram in front of you there on the, on the right-hand side. Feeling, intuition, that which you can't frame in words, that which you can't put in empirical evidence, uh, the, the inner realm of subjectivity, the deep realms, depths of consciousness. Uh, my view, which I think is supportable in a variety of ways, is that if you balance that tension of, of science, and the scientific and the spiritual, of the rational and the emotional, of what the alchemist called soul and lunar, or you know, what, what Chinese called yin, yin and yang in many ways, this kind of map onto that, then you have a recipe for a healthy and wholesome life. You also have the recipe for an expanded mind, because... Think about what expansion is and isn't. So to expand anything, you need to pull in opposite directions at the same time. It's true of a rubber band. It's true of anything where, you, where which you're trying to expand. There'll be two forces, pushes or pulls, going in opposite directions at the same time. And it's that tension of opposites that allows anything to expand, including your mind. If you want to expand your mind, you have to embrace and allow and welcome in this tension that occurs from pulling in two opposite directions at the same time. So what I present in my book is not only a map for how science and spirituality genuinely do relate, I just think it's a, it's a good map, it's also a, a way of understanding how you can develop your scientific and spiritual sides, your head and your heart, and open to the tension that you will experience in the process when you pull in opposite directions. So I'm just going to talk you through that uh, for a while. So anyway, so this is... This is um, uh, a diagram that, that appears in the final chapter of my, of my book, which is broadly, so in each chapter I go through these different pair, pairs of opposites which have a tension between them, and I describe what it means, to, what, what this tension means, how you can explore each one in your own way, and why it is that they sit in this tension, and why science has a very important affiliation with this side. Now what I don't claim is that science only sits on this side and spirituality only on this side. They have an emphasis or a preference for one side, but they both encircle the whole diagram. So I'm just going to talk you through them, and seeing as we've got 20 minutes, I think we have time for me to just talk you through all seven uh, and describe what, they, what, what each means and to kind of illuminate the tension of opposites that they uh, embody. And just a little word about opposites before I go on. Any pair of opposites sits in a strange relationship. Take light and dark, 
Uh, more of one means less of the other. So they are, in a sense, a kind of an attention that if you go too much in one direction, you neglect the other or there's less of the other. But they only can exist in relationship. You simply cannot have one without the other. They are ultimately uh, entangled such that they, you know, they are two halves of one whole. So whenever you look at a pair of opposites, you're never quite sure if it's two or one. Is it one continuum or two things that are in combination? It's, it's quite hard to say. To, to, to throw into the mix, you can sometimes get that when you have two things and you combine them, you get a third. Like say, well, you know, I mean, black and white there's a, is a pretty is a spectrum where there's nothing particularly crazy in the middle. But if you put yellow and, and blue uh, opposite each other, you know, you get green in the middle, which is uh, you know something something all novel. And you kind of get that with science and spirituality sometimes. Is that when you try and combine them in interesting mixes, you get all sorts of interesting and curious things that emerge in what I call the interface space in the middle. So let's talk let's talk these through these seven, a couple of minutes each. So we'll start on the horizontal axis, uh, outer and inner. Now science, and this is absolutely without exception, all, all forms of science require to function three things. Uh, rational thinking for argumentation, de developing hypotheses, theories, etc. Mathematical forms of analysis and uh, external sources of evidence, i.e. sources of evidence beyond the body. So. So in physics, you, know, you have whether that's a, an image of a, of, a, of, a, of a galaxy or a, or a readout from a particle accelerator, or across the other sciences, you know, a, 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 a slide that goes into a microscope, a, a, a fossil for a, for a, for a paleontologist, a, a dig that finds old human uh, ruins, uh, an archaeologist, it's always beyond the body and you can point to it and go, look, look, that's my proof, or that's my evidence that I'm going to use to support my claims. You know, biologist will point to a particular uh, uh, plant or a you know, dissected uh, uh, organism. Look, there's the evidence. And that creates very publicly available knowledge. In psychology, they use a clever trick because psychologists study things which aren't immediately visible, but they always find a way of making them external to the body. So, for example, well, there are a whole variety of tricks of doing this. So you can use, for example, ability tests where suddenly you have an external artifact with a score, and you can go, look, they got 20 in that test. That's an external thing. We point to that, measure it. Or they can, use, or it's a transcript of an interview, or it's uh, measuring behavior. And how many times did you, uh, you know, blink during that particular thing? Whatever it is, it's always something that you can externalize. So psychology sits in this strange place where often the data starts inner, but it becomes an outer thing. And by becoming outer, you can study other people, very rarely yourself. Psychology is essentially the study of other people because that's outside of you, and that's the external you need. Now, the inner path is, is it, I mean, if you were to look around this bookshop, the number of, of books which talk about inner growth, the inner journey, inner dynamics, the, 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 the journey to into consciousness, you know, that are, are uncountable, because that, that, that particular journey into your own consciousness, to the source of your own being, your own inner depths, cannot be done using the methods of science, because science is specifically looking at other people. It's looking outside of you, because that's where publicly available data is. If you want to go on your inner journey, you have to say, bye-bye science for a while, I'm going in me, I'll see you later. And it requires different methods, whether it's meditation or shamanic journeying or other means of, of, of going into, and, uh, and into, into, uh, into, the, into the depths of consciousness to realize that actually when you go in, you find something that's not really in at all. It's just another kind of out. You find things that are well beyond yourself but they just seem to be gained through the inner eye. Uh, now, that, the balance of those two things, the kind of the introvert movement within and the extrovert movement into external data and science are a key balancing act. If you do too much of one without the balance of the other, then you'll become imbalanced. You'll either become myopic to your own inner world if you're always looking out, but if you're always looking in, you'll become perhaps devoid of interest in other people. You'll become uh, uh, solipsistic, bound up in your own self. So, there's, so this, 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 this balancing act of winging up and down that, 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 that polarity is, is absolutely key, in my view, to psychological health. Um, I, thought, I thought it was interesting that some of the biggest selling non-fiction books at the moment are by Yuval Harari. I'm sure you've read some of them. Uh, Sapiens, uh, etc. But Harari uh, meditates for two hours a day, 
And I think that to be, to be that high functioning, to produce that many books of that quality, which have been selling you know, by the million around the world, that, that, that he, you know, he finds that that's the requirement for him to be, you know, for his balance between inner and outer. And uh, I think that's important. So let me take some other ones. Let's take explanation and contemplation. Science has a very particular way of dealing with things, which is that it tries to explain them. If you're trying to explain something, you're looking outside of it for something that caused it, or something that made it happen. So if you're looking to, to explain something, the thing itself, whatever it is, doesn't explain itself. There's always something beyond it. It's either in the past or governing law or something which is external, which explains it. Now, if you're trying to explain something, you're not paying attention to it because you're looking outside of it. You're thinking, what, what made it happen? What, 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 what makes it work as it does? Why is it here? It's that kind of endless regress into why. If you are trying to explain something, then you're not fully paying attention to it. And th th there are methods of full immersion of attention to a very specific thing, or to a stimulus, or to either whether it's a piece of music or something you're looking at, or a whole variety of other things, where you pay full and total attention to the thing itself. It's really the essence of many forms of art. And in the process of doing that, and not trying to explain it, if you try to explain it, then you lose the contemplative act. You lose the capacity to pay full attention. So if you immerse yourself in contemplation, you discover a different kind of truth about whatever it is you're looking at. Something which is about the, the isness of, of the thing itself, the suchness, the fact of it being without any need for explanation. And there are obviously a whole variety of contemplative, contemplative techniques that have been derived in, in, uh, in the world's spiritual traditions. The one I actually referred to in the book is, um, is the Japanese tradition of haiku, which is poetry where you, do, where you produce these tiny, pithy, descriptive poems about things which have no intention of explaining anything. They're just these little sort of firework descriptions of natural phenomena or of feelings. And the idea behind haiku is that if you pay total attention to something and then allow a haiku to come through, if you immerse yourself in something completely and don't try to explain it and then allow the haiku to come through, which is five syllables followed by seven syllables, followed by five syllables, that's the haiku thing, that you have a spiritual experience, that the haiku will act as a kind of vehicle into something that you can't explain. There are lots and lots of forms of contemplative act. Eckhart Tolle talks a lot about how to enter into full, full immersion in, with, with, uh, with, with, a, with a stimulus in front of you, whether it's a plant, whatever it may be. Um, but the crucial thing, as you see, is that it is intention. The more you try and explain, the less you contemplate. The more you contemplate, the less you try and explain. They, are, they, they act as attention. And my view is that a full understanding of anything requires both. Or indeed a full appreciation of the, the richness of, of phenomena requires both. And my view is that if you look at science and spirituality as two domains, science has an extraordinary capacity to explain using the, its governing principles. In the book I talk about atomic theory and how that can explain a myriad of things just by atoms bumping around. I mean, it is a brilliant form of explanation. It can explain heat and pressure and a whole load of things. Uh, while at the same time, spirituality is, is, is rich with contemplative traditions where the mind comes out of this buzzing, scurrying around between competing ideas and down right into whatever it is that's in front of you. I think the key with contemplation is that it's a contemplation of someone or something. Um, so let's, uh, let's take a few more to again give this idea of tension again. So let's take verbal ineffable. Um, science is a word game. Uh, I, shall, uh, no, I should extend that out. It's a word and number game. So n uh, mathematics is a language. It's a language of symbol and rule, just like uh, written languages with words, uh, that we use to try and represent reality. Science has to formulate everything it does in words, precisely because the only way of entering the corpus of scientific knowledge is as a journal article. That's literally the only way. And the journal article is a, is a, is a pretty dry piece of writing, about five to 10,000 words long. You have to, well, however esoteric your data, it has to become words and symbols on a piece of paper. It becomes, then it becomes external, it becomes a, a, you know, part of a, a, the corpus of fact, other people can test it out, try it out, try and replicate it. But there is no way around those words. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the great quantum physicists uh, said, you know, science is strung up in, in language like a, like a fly in a spider web. You know, we just can't get out of the, of the, of the tangles of language. One of the great philosophers of language, Wittgenstein, said, you absolutely 
cannot capture the whole of reality in language. There's no way. Much of our existence eludes the structures and strictures of language, with its neat lines, its little symbols, and its discrete categories. He said, you know, the, the only way you're going to get beyond language is through silence. He, he said in his Tractatus at the end, whereof we cannot speak, whereof we cannot speak, we must be silent. He said, this is the mystical, and he says that in one of the most, you know, the pip, you know most well-respected philosophical tracts of the last hundred years. Now, I think that many modern minds are caught up in a kind of endemic, acceptable mental illness, which is this absolute inability to stop thinking in words. Now, of course, if you learn meditation, then you can to a degree escape that and if you learn other contemplative or spiritual techniques there are ways out of that but I would say a lot of people really struggle and a lot of people who have yet to uh, experience that I simply find that every moment of their waking life is full of this parade of verbalised thought so no matter whether you get any outer silence there's very rarely any inner silence but if you do have the opportunity to experience reality without any language interfering The experience told across countless people who've, who've, who've encountered this, this experience beyond words is of encountering reality in a really profound fullness, almost as though you're encountering reality in what it was like before language existed, something that's really real. And, and the silence not as an absence of words. On the contrary, silence as a fullness and words as the absence of silence. Silence is a kind of plenum, something that's rich, with something that you can't tell anyone about. Precisely because that truth that you encounter doesn't fit in words. All you can do is point people in the direction, say, it's over there, try that. Uh, the, the old Buddhist adage of you can't, you know, it's, it's, uh, words are like fingers pointing to the moon, they're, never, they're not the moon itself. You, know, you can't, you mustn't mistake the map with the territory. You know, words, you know, they facilitate our interaction with each other and with the world, but they get in the way too. Getting the tension right means using language and maths to all of their brilliance, but not allowing yourself into that endemic mental illness of never escaping from those. Because if you do, you will be miserable. Because thought is a heavy, verbalised thought is a heavy thing. And if you can't let go, it drags you down. So a, a life well lived is one where there's a good mixture, a mixture of silence, of the, of the encounter with the ineffable, of that which can't fit in language and that which can. Arguably, there's a finite amount of reality that goes within language, but an infinite amount beyond. Uh, but as human beings, I think there's only so far we can go into that infinity, but it's certainly a fascinating journey. So um, what I've given you is a taster of some of the, of the seven paths. So this is what I call the seven paths between head and heart. And that they all map onto this ba the same basic dynamic. So and the idea of the diagram is, that, is to show that, yes, you have seven axes, but behind that you have two a basic duality behind which you have a basic unity. You know, that this all is part of the same uh, dynamic, the same energy, the same challenge for people, for culture, for, for getting this, uh, this sort of archetypal balance. In the book I talk about how this maps onto the right and left hemisphere of the brain, how it maps onto a whole variety of cultures that have talked about managing the two sides of human nature uh, and of creating this wholeness, which I argue in the book is becoming increasingly important given the enormous interconnectedness of our lives now, that in the past we could, we could be a specialised being over here because our effects were fairly local. You know, we, didn't, we couldn't affect the other side of the world in half a you know, split second. So we could be a kind of like a part in a larger whole. But now we live in a world where any one of you within probably seconds of now could affect Australia. You know, all you have to do is punch something into Facebook, you know, and within, I don't know what the, what the reception times in Australia, probably about 0.04 of a second, probably less would find that and, you, and who knows, would affect them and they'd go and change their behaviour over there and some, who knows, you could create radical change in Australia within a split second. Now that's an example. Uh, another example is that within two, so within, so if, 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 if um, uh, on average in Facebook people have 300 friends, on average. So at once removed, so with you and your friend and their friend, there's around about 90,000 people. So with just from, you're just one person away from 90,000 people, you're about two people away from about 30 million people. So again, this radiant effect that you can have means that, this, that, 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 we, that there's a greater responsibility on everyone to be more whole because their effects can be so enormous so quickly. 
it's almost like being, learning to be part of a hologram. You know, you have to learn how to contain the whole within yourself so that you don't, uh, you don't mess things up by being a kind of specialised but essentially imbalanced creature in, 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 a, in a whole that sort of exists at, at the cultural level. You know, we need to manifest a better level of wholeness and, well, I hope you find that my book stimulates your thoughts in that direction. Thank you very much. Thank so we have data for a lot of these things like beliefs and experiences uh, over, over an extended period of time. Um, in some cases, back as far as 100 years, but mystical experiences we have back to around about the 60s. So we've got half a century to work with uh, in terms of surveys that have been done saying, have you, do, would you say you've had a, a profound spiritual religious experience, mystical experience? And then you can simply chart the, the frequency, the number of people who, who say they have across those surveys and over time. And broadly, the, 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 the shift is, 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 is that. Now, of course, that could mean people are interpreting the question differently, more willing to admit to it than they used to be. So there are a few ways of making sense of it, but certainly it's a live and vibrant thing. It's not something that by any means is on the, on the decline. Yeah. Do you think we'll ever reach a point where spirituality is regarded as highly a science? As, as regarded as highly as science. Well, I think that there's no doubt that in some parts of society, it certainly is. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I guess it, it all hands on what highly regarded means. I mean, it, that's almost a slightly scientific, or at least it kind of contains a scientific ethos in itself, because science is all about the idea of progress and status and this kind of sense that there are much better ideas than others and it's science is very judgmental you know it's like you're wrong you're right this is better this is worse you know let's kick that one out let's take this one it's very it's it's, it's very hierarchical it's uh, it's got a kind of masculine energy to it science in a way i mean it's certainly populated by an awful lot of very competitive men so whether or not spirituality should be highly regarded i'm not sure but perhaps i'm i'm kind of being overly semantic with it but what i do think is that compared with when I was, uh, I'd say with compared with 20 years ago, when I was um, doing my undergraduate degree in the 1990s, uh, it, as a psychologist, the word spirituality was completely taboo. It was, wasn't mentioned in scientific journals, it wasn't mentioned in discourse, you couldn't write about it or talk about it very much at all. Um, it, now it's a veritable buzzword. You know, I've got a textbook on adult development, there's a big chapter on spirituality, nobody's complained, not even once it's been out since 2012. I've got this new book out on science of spirituality, my head of department was like, cool! Uh, you know, I've, uh, uh, the, the, if, you, if you kind of chart the number of times spirituality is mentioned in medical journals, it's going shoo. So it's way more credible than it used to be. But I do think that sometimes that in order to make it credible, science does dry it out a bit into something that's just basically the pursuit of meaning. Like, phew, you know, anything's the pursuit of meaning. So, uh, Anyway, there's a few random thoughts for you. I'd, I'd pretty much rejected institutionalised religion um, in my, by the time I was at university and then figured that I was a sort of child of the Enlightenment, that, re that reason and rationality and science was all that I needed. Um, I remember my dad going, saying to me, oh, you'll get over it. You know, I was like, no, no, <laughs> I just figured that my dad hadn't grown up properly. Um, but then, yeah, but come, come my mid-twenties, I realised that I was radically imbalanced and that I was missing half of my life. You know, I'd sort of, like, excised the, the, you know, the, the kind of foundational half of me, that half of me which is kind of, you know, the, the core of my being in many ways because I was so, so, you know, constantly intellectualising everything. And I've been through a very intellectual upbringing, really. You know, so there was a school that was designed for clever kids, awful sort of place for children, really. You know, uh, it's kind of, you just have this kind of very, you know, this, this world which is kind of, humming, fizzing with this sort of unhealthy amount of thought, you know, desperately want to just kind of go and let it all go and balance it out with its opposite. So for me, it was that I, in my mid-twenties, simply got unwell. Mentally, physically, I was a mess. And in that crisis, I, I, you know, I started exploring spiritually. And I realised that what I found in my spiritual explorations was everything that I'd been missing. Uh, and then I gradually came up with the ideas for this book over about ten years. So actually, it's sort of, its genesis was probably back then. Um, I'm not saying that I've been the paragon of, of you know, of, of, of uh, clarity and health and virtue since then, but I do feel that you know that it's been a, it's been a, a, a journey towards wholeness that I simply couldn't have had. And actually, I'll, I'll put it out there: I believe it's very hard for anyone to pursue the journey to wholeness with only pursuing one of these sides. If you go fully down the spiritual side, that's going to be as problematic as being solely scientific. 
If you end up solely on the scientific side, I think you might, that there are dangers towards cruelty, cynicism, and various issues. Science is cruel. The number of uh, animals that are killed in the name of science every year is, 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 is terrifying. And often, often the hideous things that are done to them before they die as well. Why? Because science is really quite impersonal. It's not particularly bothered about the subjectivity of others. Subjectivity to many scientists is an illusion. Why bother about the fact that another animal is suffering? It's just subjective suffering. But too much, too much spirituality, I think it leads to, to gullibility. You know, the old adage that if you, if, you, if you stand for nothing, you fall for everything. You know, anything's true, why not? You know, you need that critical balance. So, so, so yep, yeah, so I'll, I'll put it out there. I think this is a fundamental tension of opposites, a fundamental, well, there's a lovely, a lovely phrase that Heraclitus used called palantonos harmonia. So, palantonos harmonia, the harmony of balancing opposites. It goes all the way back to ancient Greece, this idea. There was a hand up. Oh, the, the, thank you, the, 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 the space in between. Is that what you mean? Uh, this, uh, in what I call the, uh, the interface space in my model. So the interface space is, 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 is a space where uh, a whole variety of disciplines and people and ideas have met that try and integrate science and scientific and spiritual ideas, integrate thinking and feeling and meditation and, uh, and rationality uh, and you know, shamanic journeying uh, and you know, reasoned endeavor. So, uh, I mean, you, you find a lot in this room where you find the mixture of science and spirituality. In transpersonal psychology, I would, I would point to one. I would point to a variety of mind-body uh, uh, tr treatments and therapies that have tried to integrate both inner and outer forms of healing. I point to uh, uh, um, a parapsychology to a degree as well, particularly those aspects of parapsychology where you're scientifically studying spiritual phenomena like mediums, but equally about trying to draw in spiritual practices to, to improve your science as well. There have been some excellent articles written by physicists recently, recently about how they're using spiritual practices to improve their, their work as a physicist. So it's any place where you're trying to really mix it up. But what I, what I don't think is that that's necessarily the place that everyone should hang out. Because when you try and mush them together, you tend to lose the, the distinguishing features of each one to some degree. It becomes a bit of a, of a, of a, of a sludge. Fascinating sludge. A sludge that defines our time in many ways. But you don't want to lose that sense that you kind of get the pure version of each at sort of the, the opposite ends of, of that polarity. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I think that, that, that the interface space is, 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 is a fascinating feature of our time. Sure, I mean, it's an old idea, you know. You get the, uh, when quantum physics came about almost exactly 100 years ago, almost every single quantum physicist involved in the process was exploring Eastern mysticism. Uh, and many actually were very explicit about their Eastern philosophies. So Schrodinger wrote extensively about Vedanta and about how non-duality was informing his view of the wave function. Uh, so it's an old idea, but mo modern physicists broadly, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a, I forget the name of the physicist who wrote in, I don't know if you know the online magazine Eon, A-E-O-N, but check it out. It's got some wonderful articles about science and spirituality and very erudite. And there was a recent physicist who talked about how important meditation was to his work in that he felt that it was in that space that his, his imagination and his vision and his intuition could flourish, precisely because rational thought had sort of backed off a bit. Um, so that's, that's one example for you. With that, I think we'll wrap up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.